Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. My name is Ungozi Onoha. Today I'm going to be talking to you about a very important topic on cardiac health. So I'm going to give you some background information about this particular project. So this project name is Cardiac Risk Education in Multicultural Communities in Philadelphia. And this is a project that I submitted for the 2023 Healthy Voices Impact Fund. So this particular uh, title, working title is Heart Strong, Empowering Multicultural Communities for Cardiovascular Health. So let's dive into our presentation. So the goal of this presentation is to empower individuals to make better informed choices for their cardiovascular health. So what we will learn today is cardiac risk education, how to make better informed choices for cardiovascular health. So I have to say my disclaimer here that this is purely health education content. It is not medical advice. So if you have any concerns about your health, definitely contact your healthcare provider to assist you. So it's health education content only. So this project in particular aims to provide cardiac risk education and it focuses on reducing the risk of stroke or heart attack. It seeks to raise awareness, promote healthy life choices, and provide resources for early detection and prevention of cardiovascular disease. So this is a very interesting topic and you'll soon find out why. So the problem is that in Philadelphia, the number one cause of death is heart disease. And we tend to see heart disease as people get older. However, the rates are increasing in younger people as well. So what is heart disease? What is cardiovascular disease? You're going to hear about all of this, but I have to tell you, this is a problem, not just of older people, we are also seeing the beginning of cardiovascular disease in childhood and teens. And this starts off with just arterial thickening that begins in childhood. And also when you look at other conditions like obesity, the rising rates of obesity in teens also leads to more diabetes, which causes more of this arterial thickening that can lead to heart disease. So let's talk about some statistics, okay? Some people are numbers people and you have to show them the statistics for them to believe you. So I was very surprised when I was preparing this slide to find out that heart disease is more prevalent than cancer in this area and globally actually. So I was really surprised because I thought cancer would be higher than heart disease, but it turns out that heart disease is higher uh, in Philadelphia than cancer. So cause of death from heart disease is much higher than cause of death from cancer. And it's not just in Philadelphia, it's also in the state of Pennsylvania. And this is a global statistics. We're having a um, rise in heart disease and for many reasons I'll go into. Um, in Philadelphia, uh, black and brown people are disproportionately affected by heart disease. And there are many factors that contribute to this. There is something called the social determinants of health. So it's the environment where people live, where they go to school, their access to food. So all, the, all those social factors affect um, their health. So what I say is, let's change the narrative of heart disease rates by educating people about better lifestyle and dietary options. That's a quote from me. 
All right. So I've talked about, I've, I've said heart disease many times. I've said cardiovascular disease many times. So let's try to understand exactly what it is. So what is cardiovascular disease? Um, it is actually a very broad term. So it includes a lot of uh, conditions. And sometimes it's easier when you're just talking to people to bunch it up into that category of cardiovascular disease, but it includes uh, coronary artery disease or um, coronary heart disease. So you'll, you'll find in medicine, uh, the same condition is given so many um, names or titles. So heart disease is the same as coronary heart disease and is the same as coronary artery disease. So it's basically blockage of the heart vessels. So under cardiovascular disease is also stroke, uh, also congenital heart disease, rhythm problems of the heart, heart failure, valvular, valvular heart disease, uh, peripheral vascular disease, which is of the circulation, uh, venous disease, and atherosclerosis. So as Elia mentioned, many people think cardiovascular disease is a disease of aging. It's just a disease of aging. So yes, cardiovascular disease tends to be higher in people who are older. But as we can see, these conditions of um, cardiovascular disease are occurring in younger adults in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. So cardiovascular disease isn't exclusive to older adults. Data shows that cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular disease mortality are increasing among younger populations. So back to cardiovascular disease again. So as mentioned, cardiovascular disease are the most, are the number one cause of death in the United States. The most common type of cardiovascular disease is coronary artery disease or coronary heart disease. And in this scenario, what happens is that the blood vessels that supply the heart become narrow or blocked and it can present chronically with um, chest pain, shortness of breath, palpitations, leg swelling or fatigue. So basically here you see a diagram of the heart and you see the coronary arteries that supply the heart muscle and those are pretty small vessels compared to the bigger vessels. They're pretty small and it's quite easy for them to get blocked off. So they can get blocked off with cholesterol plaque and just build up. So here you can see the drawing of a buildup of plaque. And if that plaque continues to build up, it can cause a blockage. Now that blockage means that that heart area will not get blood supply. And that is what causes heart attack, angina, ischemic heart disease, poor circulation to the heart, congestive heart failure, rhythm problems of the heart. So when the heart muscle is not getting enough blood flow, it becomes sick, it becomes uh, deficient of blood. And so that heart muscle becomes weak and uh, that's when um, the person can have a heart attack. So there are certain risks we can control and there are certain risks that we cannot control. So some of the risks that we cannot control, we cannot control our age. You know, as we get older, people get heart disease. Uh, we cannot control our gender. We cannot control our family history. So those are some things that we cannot control. But the good news is that there are some risks that we can control. And when we control these, these risks, we minimize our risk of heart disease. So let's talk about the risks we can control. So some of these risks include lipids, blood pressure, blood glucose, tobacco, inactivity, and obesity. So let me give you some uh, information here. And I'm going to just sh uh, share some little uh, nuggets. And uh, like I said, this is purely health education. And most of the things that I'm talking about, you can just find on Google. If you Google heart disease, you will find most of the things that I'm talking about today. So this is not in any way medical advice. It is purely health education. So 
Did you know that high blood pressure or hypertension affects about two out of every five African-American adults in USA? And as we all know, hypertension is a major risk factor for heart disease. So I'm going to share two nuggets with you. Um, if you've got high blood pressure, ensure that you follow your provider's advice, your health provider's advice. And understand that you can purchase a blood pressure cuff and monitor your blood pressure as advised by your healthcare provider. So let's look at blood pressure categories. Sometimes people are not sure what is high blood pressure, what is hypertension. They don't know the numbers. So let's go over the numbers. The numbers are very important. So blood pressure is a measure of how your heart pumps and how it, relax. it relaxes. So when it pumps, you get the top number or upper number. It's called the systolic. So that's when your heart pumps. And then when your heart relaxes, it, you get the lower number or the diastolic. So we typically say blood pressure, normal blood pressure. Okay, it's less than 120 over 80. So that's how we call it, 120 over 80. So if you have someone with a blood pressure of 110 over 70, that is a fantastic blood pressure. So you would say blood pressure is 110 over 70. So as those numbers start to rise, if you have anything between 120 to 129 of systolic or uh, you have and sorry and you have a diastolic of less than 80 but your systolic is between 120 to 129 your blood pressure is considered elevated so it is mildly elevated. It's not quite at the high blood pressure range, but it is getting there. Now, when you look at a reading that is 130 to 139 systolic, that's the top number or upper number, or the diastolic, which is the lower number, or the bottom number is between 80 to 89. It is considered stage one high blood pressure. So depending on your risk factors, the, your provider may start you on medications depending on your risk factors. So, and then if it gets to, if your systolic gets to greater than 140 or higher, or your diastolic, which is the bottom number, is 90 or higher, you are at stage 2 high blood pressure. More than likely, you are taking medications at this stage. Now, hypertensive crisis is when the blood pressure is greater than the, the systolic, that's the top number, greater than 180, and or the diastolic is higher than 120. So you're looking at greater than 180 and or the diastolic higher than 120. So that is considered a hypertensive crisis. So most people at this point would either go to the emergency room, especially if they're having symptoms like chest pain, weakness in arms or limbs, um, dizziness, palpitations, uh, facial droop. Uh, this is a very high number and it can actually lead to a stroke or a heart attack. So these are the blood pressure categories that I've shared with you. This is a really good slide. So make sure you save this video. You can take a snapshot and you can refer to it from time to time. So you want to be in the green area, which is the normal blood pressure. And that is a systolic of less than 120 and a diastolic of less than 80. So the next risk that we can control is blood glucose. Most people with diabetes have high blood pressure. So these two conditions can't coexist. So one thing I will tell you is uh, diabetes can be treated. And in some people, they have been successful in reversing it. So now there are some fantastic medications on the market and it is important 
to get screened for diabetes. So typically an adult who's 18 and above would go to um, a doctor's office once a year to get a physical. So during that physical, a blood test might be ordered and their blood pressure checked. So the blood test to check for diabetes is called the A1C. And so if you have some risk factors, family history or your Bs, um, it's, it's good to get the A1C checked to assess if you might be at risk of having diabetes. So having diabetes also adds to cardiac risk. So the next risk we can control is lipids. So elevated total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, as well as elevated triglycerides are risk factors for heart disease. So all this junk food is of no good to us. And sometimes if somebody's cholesterol is really, really high, um, when the blood is drawn, you can actually see the cholesterol lipid particles in there. You will see this milky um, uh, layer in the, in, the, in the test tube. And that means there's a ton of cholesterol floating around in the circulation. Now, that cholesterol has to go somewhere, right? So where does it go? It goes into the lining of the blood vessels and builds up plaque. And that is what eventually leads to heart attack and strokes. So we're talking about cardiac risk evaluation. Now I'm going to talk to you about this very important heart risk calculator. So this is a risk calculator that your doctor will perform for you. So I'm providing this here just for education so that you know what to expect. So this is typically administered by a healthcare provider. And uh, your healthcare provider will just need uh, your blood pressure and your cholesterol numbers to plug in this calculator for you. So it's very easy. Um, it's got, there's an app. So there's an app to calculate your heart risk. So this heart risk calculator is called ASCVD arteriosclerosis, cardiovascular disease risk calculator. And it calculates the 10 year risk of heart disease or stroke. And this is for people between the age of 40 to 75 without a history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Oh, that's such a mouthful. So let's just call it ASCVD. And the LDL cholesterol, which is a bad cholesterol, is between 70 and 189. So if someone gets their cholesterol checked and their LDL cholesterol is 190 and above, this is so high. So you can't really use this calculator. They probably need to be taking cholesterol lowering medication. So that's why we don't use this calculator for the people who have a very high LDL cholesterol 190 and above more than likely they have some kind of familial hyperlipidemia so something they've inherited um, that causes the cholesterol to be high so those people really they want to see a lipid specialist so a lipid specialist is who they want to see so uh, this calculator is quite easy to use. Anybody can use it, but it is administered by a healthcare provider because they'll provide the interpretation of the results and the action steps. So for, for what to do next. So it just needs the age to be plugged in the gender the race, the blood pressure, like mentioned, the systolic is the top number, the diastolic is the bottom number, and the total cholesterol, the LHDL cholesterol, and find out is there a history of diabetes, yes, no, is the person a smoker, are they taking blood pressure medications, yes, no. And then uh, the, the calculator will now provide a percentage and that percentage can now guide uh, whether that person needs to be taking medication called statin. Statin is medication that is used to lower 
cholesterol. So the, the usual risk is 7.5. So if a person has 7.5 and above, then more than likely they need to be on this medication called statin because their risk, 10 year risk for uh, ASCVD, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, <laughs> that long <laughs> acronym is high. So 7.5, um, they more than likely need to be on this medicine. Okay, so this is a very important uh, slide, this calculator that I've shown to you. I just need you to be aware that this is what will happen if your cholesterol is high. Your doctor will calculate your heart risk and tell you what your percentage is. And then you will have a discussion with your provider, what we call um, shared medical decision making, where you decide, okay, what you want to do, if you want to be on the medicines or not. Um, the medicines definitely has some side effects, but you have to weigh your risks versus your benefits. If you've got a very strong family history, if you've got risk factors that you cannot control, uh, if you've got diabetes that's not controlled, you really want to be taking medicine that is statin so that you can bring your LDL cholesterol, which is the bad cholesterol, as low as possible. So let's move on uh, with this presentation. I'm going to talk to you about smoking. Smoking tobacco is a big no-no because it causes um, heart disease. And even uh, most recently, researchers have found that cannabis also uh, increases the risk of heart disease. So let's just say all types of smoking, whatever it is, causes risk of heart disease. So um, there is medication for people who are struggling with nicotine abuse. And the good thing is that within a year of quitting smoking, the heart attack risk drops dramatically. All right, let's talk about the BMI. Uh, BMI stands for body mass index. So any BMI that's 30 and up is considered obese. And we know that people who are overweight or obese, they have a higher risk of heart disease because um, carrying that extra weight puts a little extra stress on the heart and blood vessels. So the heart has to do more work to pump blood around. And so that strain can predispose to heart um, disease. So the BMI is typically what we use uh, to determine, um, you know, the optimal weight of a person. So it's used to screen for weight problems and it is easy for you to calculate your body mass index. So if you're watching this video on YouTube, you will see in the description, I will have a link where you can actually calculate your body mass index. And all you need to calculate this is your height and your weight. So it's a very simple formula and you can calculate it easily. So uh, I've talked about these risk factors that we can control. Uh, there are more risk factors that we can control, but these are the uh, most common ones that have significant impact. If we can just tackle one or two of these factors, then definitely we can reduce our risk for heart disease and reduce the deaths from heart disease. So I'm just going to put my disclaimer again. Um, I am not providing medical advice. This is just a guide and I'm not a registered dietitian. Uh, I'm not a nutritionist. So all I'm doing today is providing general advice. So to have a better heart health, there are some things that we can do. I've already talked about reducing our risk and then I've talked about controlling disease, certain metabolic disease that contribute to heart health risk. And so I'm going to talk about some other things that we can do. So our food choices. So how do we eat? Are we eating junk food every day? So how do we eat? So food choices are very important. So research has shown that people who eat 
this. They call it a Mediterranean diet. So this is a diet that's got a lot of vegetables, fruits, legumes like beans, nuts, whole grains, and fish. They tend to live longer. They have better health, less heart disease. So Mediterranean diet, we are all for it. But we know it is so hard. I come from a culture where we eat a lot of rice. We eat fufu, we eat rice, we fry plantain. And so that is the culture. And so it can be very hard to incorporate a Mediterranean diet if this is not your culture, this is not your background. So you're not used to it. If you grew up on junk food, it is very hard to incorporate vegetables. Some people don't like vegetables. So I would say take baby steps and introduce vegetables into your diet. Um, I have to eat rice at least once a week. So what I do is I eat my rice quite all right, but I've started adding vegetables and I've started adding beans. And then I uh, started uh, adding fish and reduced the number of days that um, I cook with meat. So uh, these are all things that you can do. It doesn't have to be all or none. Um, you can still eat a little bit in moderation. So I always say this to people, whenever you make changes, make sure that you're making small changes slowly because your body is what is like an ecosystem. Uh, it's it's, it's used to functioning a certain way. And when you put too much on it, too fast, too quick, uh, it's not going to like it. And that's why sometimes you see people who do a lot of these fat diets and they don't succeed in the long term because it's not sustainable. So anything that is too hard, it's a lot of work. Uh, you may do it for like a week, two weeks. And then after some time, you just can't sustain it because your body's ecosystem them is used to a particular way of doing things okay so that's my little take-home point is whatever you're doing in terms of making a lifestyle changes or dietary changes it has got to be little steps over a period, long period of time so adding vegetables is a good way there's a vegetable that a lot of people don't like, but it's absolutely wonderful. It's called Brussels sprouts. And Brussels sprouts have got, they've got a lot of nutrients. They've got a lot of fiber. So just having fiber, um, having those nutrients can reduce your risk of these metabolic problems that I've talked about, the um, the cholesterol problem, the blood problem with blood sugar, and also um, be mindful of salt intake. There are people who they like to cook with a lot of salt. And some people are salt sensitive. When they eat a lot of salt, their blood pressure instantly goes up. So um, if you are a salt sensitive person, you really want to avoid that excess salt intake. Make sure you exercise regularly. I'm all for walking every day. Uh, make sure you're getting adequate amounts of sleep and reduce your stress. Stress can cause heart disease because it can cause your heart rate and blood pressure to go up. That puts a strain on your heart. Reduce your calories. Keep your body mass index normal and avoid alcohol as much as you can. Uh, researchers have found that even little amounts of alcohol can be harmful to the heart. So I've got resources for you in the description and very important, I have to say thank you to the sponsors of this project. Funding for this project was provided by Healthy Voices Impact Fund at the Community Foundation of New Jersey, which was funded by a contribution from Jensen Pharmaceuticals, Inc. This is health education content and not medical advice. And I want to say thank you so much for listening and please share with your friends. Have a wonderful day.